Hi friend, I hope you are well and staying safe out there. I need to thank Jackie Moranti for writing and researching this episode. I also want to thank JT Hosack for his help with this case as well. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon and Ko-Fi supporters. If you want to support this show, go to patreon.com slash trueconsequences or ko-fi.com slash trueconsequences. Finally, I have a new merch store on my website available right now. There's all new products waiting for you to order them, so go check them out and let me know what you think. One more final announcement, I will be attending CrimeCon in Las Vegas April 29th through May 1st, and if you're interested, True Consequences listeners can save 10% on their CrimeCon admission just by entering the code TRUECONSEQUENCES. Okay, let's get back into the case. We've reached somewhat of the midpoint of the series, and I don't usually spend time talking a lot about the people who commit these terrible crimes. But in this case, I think it's important to understand who Mark Redwine is. We have spent a lot of time over the last few weeks learning about Dylan and what happened to him. Now I am asking, who is Mark Redwine? I am Eric Carter Londine, and this is True Consequences Negligence, the Dylan Redwine Story. Much of Mark Redwine's past is unknown. We don't know much about his childhood or his family. He does claim that his stepfather was very strict, but he doesn't elaborate on him much. Mark does mention that his stepfather was in the Navy, and that he would discipline Mark and his brother. Sometimes this included hitting them. He didn't meet his real father until he was 16 years old. His mother asked his father to take him because she couldn't handle him anymore. So was your um, stepfather pretty strict? Well, he, he was Navy as well. And, you know, anytime you're around military people, there's a set protocol on how you do things. And so yeah, was you, he, he, was, <laughs> he was fairly strict. I mean, you know, I, he, he monitored every little thing we did. You know, you don't talk back to your mother. If you do, you got one smacked upside the head. Oh, what? The, how old were you when he came into your work? <sighs> oh, I don't know. I want to say around ten or twelve, maybe. Was it a big change? Well, my mom, I think, had a difficult time yeah. when we were younger, and you know, what I guess I saw in her was that she was looking for somebody to take care of her. Okay. And I've always resisted that because, you know, I want to be able to do things for myself and not rely on somebody else. But, you know, that I guess I was so young, I, I didn't really think about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, anytime you get into a new relationship, things yeah. are all good. But then over <laughs> time, the real person comes out. Mm -hmm. What did you, well, what do you mean by that? What real person? Is it well, I mean, I, I think that anytime you're in a start a relationship you're on your best behavior right you know it, it's when you start actually being yourself yeah you know that, that that you learn who the person is that you're with and and you know i don't i don't think in the beginning you know of their relationship mm -hmm. you know he was always you know giving us candy or attentive and nice exactly yeah. and then all of a sudden you know that kind of stuff goes okay. away and you start getting the discipline and yeah, smack across the head. And... You know, and, and, and at that early age, I didn't have much in the way of a father figure. I never, at that point, had met my real father. 
Oh, really? Yeah, okay. so I didn't have any kind of a father figure. So in many ways, that was probably not a bad thing yeah. to have that. But Do you think you, was he the kind of father figure that you would emulate, that you would like to be like, or mm, did he have qualities you didn't probably, like? Probably not, because there was qualities that I didn't like about him. <laughs> you know, I mean, his theory was children were just be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't talk at the dinner table, which is the best time for families, in my opinion, yeah, to absolutely. actually spend time talking yeah. about your day, because that's the one time that you generally can be <laughs> together to do that kind yep. of thing. But, you know, it was never like that with him growing up. Huh. You know, his theory was children were to be seen enough. Yeah, I would have a hard time with that. And it's kind, of the old, it's kind of an old school way of thinking, I think. I mean, that's probably how he was raised, maybe. I don't know. So did you ever get to meet your real father? Uh, eventually. How did that go? Mm, kind of went over like a lid balloon. <laughs> really? Yeah. Did he, I mean, was he aware of you or was it a surprise? Well, he was aware of me and there was just a situation that I had gotten into with my mom. Okay. She uh, called him finally and didn't know what to do with me. So she <laughs> called him and that for the first time he came into my life. And again, at first, you know, he's trying to buy my love, or he bought me a car. And, oh, wow. You know, okay. Not a yeah. nice car by any means. Yeah. But, but you know, when you're 16 and you're learning how to drive, who cares? You know, <laughs> trying to make dope. up for lost time. Yeah. You know, so, but, uh, you know, eventually I went to stay with him for a little while, but that didn't work out really well. Okay. Is he still around? No, he's passed away a few years back. I never had anything much to do with him as an adult. Were you a rebellious teenager? Very much so. Okay. We've uh, scratched below the surface a little bit, prying into your life. We found out a lot of stuff. Um, and I feel that your whole life has been kind of a lie. Just some really odd things about you, name changes and um, things just seem very convenient for you. You might have to be a little more specific so I can kind of follow you along here. Well, just in reference to like your first family, your second family, things that people say about you in response to what they say, things that you say about yourself, and what we've discovered, it just seemed like you've been a disingenuous person your whole life. He was born Mark Allen Whittington on August 24th, 1961. Now, I don't know when he changed his last name to Redwine or why. There's no information out there that explains this. Mark does have a criminal record and some of that record includes violence. He has been arrested for assault, child abuse, menacing, and trespassing in 2003. He made a plea deal down to disorderly conduct for those charges. He was arrested for burglary prior to his arrest, and other than that, he's got a clean record, even though he doesn't seem to like law enforcement. Well, and, and I know not everyone likes law enforcement, and I'm okay with that, and um, this is not... Uh, I know that we need that in our society mm -hmm. now, but I, I'll be honest with you, I've never been a big fan of law enforcement. <laughs> and that's all right. I'm okay. But, you know, I, I try to treat them with respect. I, I appreciate that. I try to, you know, be understanding that they got a difficult job and they're probably not making a lot of money to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, just to give you an example. Anytime I get pulled over, I always put my hands mm -hmm. on the steering wheel because I, I want the officer coming up to be able to see that he ain't got nothing to worry about or right. that I'm not fumbling for something or there's any reason for him to have any concern. And they appreciate Until that. Until he gets up there and then if I need to get in the glove box to get my license and registration mm -hmm. or the registration, I acknowledge to him. And I was, not all people think of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. but I do that just because no, it's, I think it's much it makes their job easier. It does. Um, and I think, 
and I know, again, you're not a fan of law enforcement, and that's all right. We're doing absolutely everything that we can to find Dylan. And, and I know you are, but you got to admit that, you know, for me, mm -hmm. it's very frustrating because I know that there's things that you guys are doing behind the scenes that mm -hmm. nobody sees, and that's good. But, you know, that's where I think, you know, with everybody else, we all start to get frustrated because we're not seeing mm -hmm. with our eyes what we think we should be seeing. Outwardly, he seems like your average guy. He held a job, owned a home, had a family. He had friends. But you see, Mark can be compulsive. He makes bad choices. He admits that to everyone around him. He even goes so far as to describe himself as self-destructive. Trying to understand why I, in many ways, am self-destructive. I mean, you and Dylan being very similar, um, what do you think he'd expect of you? To be strong for him. What else? Choices. It seems that Mark was struggling with his sexuality and he was exploring different fetishes. He was engaging in coprophilia, which is described or defined as getting sexual pleasure from feces. It is believed that Mark may have had some latent homosexuality tendencies, though this has not been confirmed. He also engaged in cross dressing. Now, I don't say any of this to make you think that this makes Mark a bad person. Everybody has their own things that they like and are experiencing. And far be it from me to judge anybody. Now, the problem with this, though, is that Mark was married to Elaine and he kept these things from her. Mark was living a life of regret and shame. His addictions have taken over his life. He was struggling with an apparent addiction or at least dependency on alcohol and sex, and he tried with all his might to hide these addictions, but he wasn't able to. He's not a good liar, but he won't admit the truth. It's a nagging feeling that just eats you from the inside out. I mean, not knowing is, is probably the worst thing that could possibly happen to a parent when it relates to their children, you know? And it, it just eats you from the inside out because there's so many things that run through your mind. You know, you play this over and over again in your head. You think of every possible scenario that you can possibly think of. You know, when I go into town, everybody I see, I, I look at them as like, where's my son? Like everybody I look at, I, I, first question I want to have to them is, where's my son? And I, I know that's a rational way to think, but that's how, that's how I feel. And, you know, that's something that I struggle with every day when I'm praying to him, when I'm talking to him. You know, these are things that I, I say to him. We need to have you home and we need to, you need to find a way to get to a phone or find a way to reach out to somebody or, you know, pray to your abductors that they're going to let you go and, and everything's going to be okay and we're going to have our son back. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's no, my, that's fine. I turned my work one off, but... Anna, did you have any questions? You've been kind of the silent partner in all this. I, just, I keep thinking that, you know, you guys were on a mission to see all the ballparks and NASCAR tracks, and I'm sure you're not done yet, right? You not even close. Things. You got some unfinished business. Absolutely. Which one? Which one are you planning to go see next with him? Well, our focus has been on trying to find the ones that are the hardest for us to get to, which for us here tend to be in the north. What's the first thing you're going to do when you see him again? Give him a hug and tell him how much I love him, and ask him what it is he wants. Because whatever it is, I'll give it to him. I'll find a way to make it happen for him whatever he wants, which is probably my biggest weakness with him. Yeah. He doesn't know the word no with me. Mm. Anything he wants, he's got me wrapped around his finger. There's not very few things I will ever say no to him about. 
but you know things that are important to him like his baseball he's not a big nascar fan but we can incorporate those mm -hmm. things i think it's hard for him to sit and watch that kind of thing unlike baseball where he understands the concepts and mm -hmm. what's going on but you know Corey's much more of a nascar fan than dylan mm -hmm. really is but it's still something that i i think is important as father and son that we have the ability to be able to do together yeah. because those are memories of a lifetime that nobody can take away nobody do you know where dylan currently is no Before Dylan came to visit you this last Sunday, had you ever lied to a person in authority to keep from getting into trouble? No. Are you currently hiding any knowledge of Dylan's location? No. Okay, still, just as any. Anything that cause you any problems? Any other questions that you remember? Mm -hmm. oh, it's a little awkward. Yeah. Let's well, try it for a moment and pull on another chart. How's your arm doing? Oh, I don't know. It's kind of getting numb a little bit. These ones. Yeah, you're ready. We're ready. Are you ready for another chart? So, okay. <coughs> All right. Good pressure in the cuff. You try to remain, you know, like I said, as still as you can, breathe normal, all that kind of, as much as you can. I know this is not a normal thing you get every day. No, this is very abnormal. Actually. Okay, and if you can remain still, test is beginning. Do some people call you Mark? Yes. You plan to lie to any question on this test today? No. For Dylan came to visit you this last Sunday. Have you ever committed a crime that you've never been caught for? No. At any point after Monday morning when you left for work, have you known where Dylan was? No.
before Dylan came to visit you this last Sunday? Had you ever lied to a person in authority to keep from getting into trouble? No. Do you know where Dylan currently is? No. That's a tough question. Before Dylan came to visit you this last Sunday, had you ever lied and blamed someone else for something you had done? No. Are you currently hiding any knowledge of Dylan's location? No. Give me a still test then. Anything there cause you any problems? Yeah, also, you're talking and stuff, and which is not not going to be real easy. Well, going well, I, know, I know, but these are tough questions because I got to tell you. What? No. Okay. Uh, are you having an issue with any of those questions, or? Well, I have my own suspicions as to where Dylan is. So, you know. Okay, and we're talking about is where you know. Yeah, no, I understand, and I'm the, I don't know where he's at, but I, you know, I have my suspicions as to. Or he could be, for sure. Right. You okay with the questions then? Or do we need to read? Mm -hmm. We should start over and redo these. No, I mean, I understand the need for all of this. Okay. All right. This is, they're just tough questions. Okay. Well, if you to read. give us yes or no answer to, I guess that's kind of where my point is. All right. Well, and we'll cover that here in a minute. So, why don't you go ahead, if your arm's ready, we'll run another chart. Hey, Mark, we've never met. No, we haven't. And I suspect well, sometimes things get out of hand a little bit okay. with what goes on. You know, I have kids and everything, and I know that you know I've been fortunate to uh, you know there hasn't been a custody issue, but I've come from that kind of background. And sometimes we do things to protect our children or whatever. You, you. Uh, Failed this test miserably. Really? To the max. Somebody that's blind can see that you have a major reaction. Out. So, yeah, I'll get back from you. Here's either people go about causing a bunch of problems in the community because, you know, like the Bloom Boy and all that kind of stuff, or things just get out of hand and then, you know, just get out of hand if it wasn't intended consequences. I know that you lost custody of Dylan. Well, but the I board. don't think it was necessarily custody. Okay. But this has kind of gone on long enough, don't you think? You know where Dylan is. I don't know where Dylan's at. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, all I can tell you is that the test says that you you are you know you're aware of where Dylan is and, and stuff. So. God, I don't know anything about it. Okay. But 
Right. Like I said, that's that right there. Yeah. You know, if you know where he is, if they're going to know eventually. I have no doubt that that's the case. Okay. They they will know eventually. Uh, all I can tell you is that you you know if you were unable to pass this polygraph, you failed it miserably. So you know where it shows that you have knowledge of of where Dylan is. What's running through your head? What do you think's running through your head that would cause you to to fail this polygraph? Oh, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the anger that I have towards my ex-wife in all of this. Do, if do you, when I ask you the question, if you know where Dylan currently is now, and you tell me no, your body just goes off the, <laughs> off the. Well, that's because in large part I suspect that he's with his mom, or he, she has some knowledge of where he's at. Okay, because all, all I can tell you is that you, you're, you know, you're reacting to these questions. I don't know where, what the. Reason is, do you have to tell me what no, the reason is? I understand. Okay. And, and again, do you know where Dylan currently is? Are you currently hiding knowledge of Dylan's location? Or just, uh, you know, the max on, on this that we could possibly get that you're reacting to? What are you? What are you? Because I, I, I firmly think that mom has some involvement in this thing. But you wouldn't know where he was. That's a question. It's just I don't know where he is. I know that he's been seen recently, and you know I have no knowledge of where he's at. You know, my understanding is that he could potentially be with some friends of his. But you're telling me you you have no idea where he is at this. Time. I have no idea where he's at at this time. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, we'll just go ahead and and uh, let the sheriff's department know. No, uh, I understand. Uh, I don't know how else to 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 word this. You know, are you, are you currently hiding any knowledge of Dylan's location? You wouldn't be hiding that he's with his mother. You'd be telling us if you knew where he that he, well, he was. I, I don't know that for a fact, but you know that's just the way I feel. So you know, I'm, okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go ahead and touch base with the sheriff's department on this. You have any questions? Yeah, yeah. You may. Do you have any questions of me? Um, no. I, mean, I, like I said, I kind of thought that this is one of the processes that we would all be going through. So, okay. You know, I don't really have any questions other than, you know, I don't understand the results there. But okay. All right. All right. Nice to meet you. Sure. you yeah. know. I believe that Mark does love his children, but he loved them as children. The children that adored their father before they found the fetish photos and suffered because of his addiction. I didn't understand that that child has meant everything in my life. And it's not just him. It's both Corey and Dylan. They both mean everything to me. Unfortunately for Corey, I have always been closer to Dylan. It's not Dylan, Corey's fault. It's nobody's fault. For the first five years of Dylan's life, I was there. I was the one that saw him walk. I was the one that fucking heard the first words out of his mouth. I was the same thing that most women have always been for all of their children. But I got to experience that. I can't tell you what that means to me. I have always had an appreciation for what women have gone through for all of their lives, knowing that it's not about sitting around eating bonbons and watching the young and the restless as it relates to watching their children and taking care of their children. I have a whole new appreciation for what that means, to be the woman. Mark is selfish. He doesn't like women and he will admit that. He often calls himself a misogynist. It must be the misogynist in me. Because there ain't but one thing a woman can do for me, and, and it ain't cleaning my house, and it ain't cooking for me, and it ain't none of that kind of stuff. What's, what's that? Sexual needs? Or? It's about all a woman can do for me. I don't want to hear their mouth. I don't want to hear their shit. I don't want to hear their nagging. I don't want to hear none of that crap. You know, and, and I guess that's part of the misogynist, 
misogynist in me that, mm. you know, I have no problem being on my own without the company. Not to say that, you know, that wouldn't be, I don't think about that kind of stuff, but, you know, the shit you got to go through to get it ain't worth it. Mm. As his children grew, they grew away from him. Mark wasn't prepared for that. People with addiction problems sometimes like to control their surroundings because they know that their lives are out of control. And when Mark could no longer control his children, when he realized he was losing control, he became more depressed and more aggressive and more confused. He wanted to hang on to his children as long as he could despite their feelings for him. Mark went to great lengths to control these situations. He went to extremes to get his way. He got angry and belligerent and at any perceived slight, especially when he drank heavily. I've never hated my wife. I never hated her for anything. But she wants everybody to believe that I hated her to the point that I would kill my son. I don't hate her. I've never hated her. The only hate that comes comes from her. For 18 years I've listened to this woman tell me how I hate you, you son of a bitch, you're a piece of shit. For 18 years I've listened to this shit. I I firmly believe that the hate that, that she instills is a large part of who my older son, Corey, has become. But, you know, what you said just before that, I'm not sure... I understand what you were trying to say, so I would ask for a little bit of clarification. On and, that. and feel free if you don't understand what I'm trying to say to clarify. Well, and, and you know, you, you started to say one thing, but you ended up saying another thing. Well, and that's what I'm trying to clarify. Go ahead. Well, again, you know, this is my interpretation. Maybe I'm wrong in what you started to say, but what you started to say is that you didn't think that there was any way that I could be here trying to respect my son and be here for him. What I was trying to say, it felt like to me you were trying to explain why you were here. And I guess my intent, uh, Mr. Redwine, was to say, I I don't think there's any way a parent prepares to go through something like this, nor do I think there's any way that is the right or wrong way for a parent to grieve or for a parent to try to figure out how to be close to their lost child or their memory or and so I, what I was trying to say is you don't have to explain to me why you're here okay because well, apparently that's where I misinterpreted oh, yeah, and that's where I guess what I was what I was trying to say is look I, I don't I gotta be honest with you um, this is a beautiful spot and if this is if this is the spot, my son that, is out there. I know. Ninety-eight percent of my son is out there. Where else can I be right now to be close to him? Do you not understand how important that being a father or being a mother or even being a parent at all, and knowing that your son is still out here? How else am I supposed to be close to him than to be here right now? I think that makes sense. I don't think you have to justify that to anybody. I'm not trying to justify it to you or anybody else because I don't give a fuck what you or anybody else thinks. I'm here because this is what I know how to do for my son. I've been communicating to him as best as I can and understanding that music is a, has always been a form of communication with he and I. And and for me to sit here and, and have my iPod playing is things that is a way for me to communicate with him because this is how we have always communicated. I'm here because this is the only way I know how to be close to my son. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what, how to explain the two percent of his remains that have been found. But what I can tell you is that ninety percent of his or ninety eight percent of his remains are still at large are unaccounted for. That is a huge issue to me. To me, that means that he's still a missing child. You can't take two percent and expect that everybody's going to assume that he's been found. He hasn't been found. Ninety eight percent of my son is still scattered without 
and my house sits right down at the bottom of this hill. For me to look out my front door means that I have to look at this mountain and know that my son is still here. You can never teach a 13 or <laughs> a 21 year old the value of money, but you know, try and embed into their mind you can't spend more than you get. So, you know, that took a little bit of time while we were gone. You know, they were processing the ATM card. There was a bunch of issue about the ATM card because I don't think he ever could get it to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they sent me a PIN number in the mail. I gave it to Dylan, but there was never any interaction with that debit card on Dylan's part. Okay. And, and again, I, I feel that, that is, it's possible that Elaine had something to do with that. I don't think Elaine liked the fact that, you know, I could provide Dylan money. Well, I think she took that personally. Well, okay. Um, in terms of sending a check to Elaine, that was the first time you sent her a check, mm -hmm. correct? Um, but you had this account for Dylan. Right. Um, is there a reason that you sent her a check versus just putting it in the account? Because it, my understanding was the ATM card didn't work, and so there would no be no way for her, because Dylan didn't have the checks. Mm -hmm. I had the checks in my house. So Dylan, Dylan wouldn't have any access to being able to access that money if he never got his ATM card working. Okay. But he could have gotten checks for that account, right? Well, the, the ones that they printed up for us at the time. I mean, I didn't order a box of checks for him. Okay. So you're sending the check to Elaine because Dylan can't access his account? No. I sent the check to Elaine because Elaine was having a conversation with me about child support okay. and I had no problem with child support. I had no issues with paying child support. So I sent her a check for $200 and because she was so evasive or elusive in terms of where she actually was living. I mean, she, one minute she's in Colorado Springs, one minute she's at her mom's, one minute, you know, the whole monument thing never came up, even though I knew about it okay. in that. So that's where I was pinning her down. Where exactly do you want me to send them? You know, she didn't want me to know where she worked. She didn't want me to know where she lived. She, I, you know, I, for two months, I didn't even know where Dylan was laying his head. So you sent the check in order to figure out where she was. Well, that was part of it. Part. We, we've been up at, we, oh, we unlocked the gates and stuff, and we've been up at, and there's still a lot of snow. Uh, there are sections that are impassable. I was up there last week. There's like three feet of snow uh, about 10 miles up, and you can't get you know, so. Well, and why am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah. It's the way it is. Right? Yeah, so it's going to be a while. Uh, definitely be, be a while before it's no more. But yeah, we're, we're that's why we're up here. We're still searching in certain areas and stuff. So just, drop, I, I, just wanted I to drop in. That's great because it's important that we search everything. Uh -huh. You know, my I don't believe Dylan's here. I don't believe he's in the lake. I don't believe he's in Visito. I don't believe he's even in the Platte County. My whole point in getting Wendy involved wasn't was nothing more than trying to eliminate Vicedo as an area of interest. Uh, you know, as 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 Dylan's dad, your intuition's probably correct. I mean, you know, he's probably not here, but we've got to look. No, but, and I understand that. And I know. think every stone needs to be turned yeah. over, and every tree stump needs to be looked into, and every dead log needs to be rolled over. Mm -hmm. That's what it takes. That's why I want you to help. With searches, I mean, give us some input. I mean, work, work hidden when you work. You know, you know. To me, it's a two-sided thing. You I mean it's one thing to have your feet on the ground and actually being turning over rocks, but you know, also there's the search for the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess a lot of my focus is trying to figure out. Because let's be honest, there ain't a whole lot of possibilities here. I mean. Dylan either walked out this door with a specific place in mind and something happened along the way, or a car pulled up, he got into the car, and they took off. Whether, you know, whether it had something to do with his mom or, you know, some friend of Corey's or who the hell, who the hell knows? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Yeah. I don't know. I will tell you that in all of this, because a lot of this has been random thoughts just run through my mind and so I'm trying to gather those thoughts and, and try to put them down in, in a, a way that 
I, I could see the big picture. You see what I'm saying? And it occurred to me that somehow, because I know my ex-wife, my first wife and my second wife, over the years, had built a bridge somewhere in talking to each other. I mean, it was pretty apparent to me when my first wife showed up at Dr. Phil that a large part of the reason why she had been there was because I think Elaine was trying to bring her in to convince Dr. Phil that I was somehow a threat to uh, you know, Corey. Anyway, when the truth is, I don't know. <laughs> They're not going to hurt you. <laughs> it took me a while to figure that out. But, but it occurred to me, and, and, and I, I called Joe, the FBI guy here, yeah. the other day, and, and I was running to buy him. You know, he was a little short with me, and he's like, well, it's all in the hands of Platte County, and I'm like, well, I'm coming to you because maybe you got more resources, or you got, you know, a different way to handle it. The bottom line is, and, and I can't help but think that you guys already know this, and if you don't, then you haven't looked in the right places. But years ago, my ex-wife filed a motion out of Jefferson County to relocate those two boys to Arizona. In that motion that was granted, she had 24 hours to notify me. I didn't hear from her for five years. I hired private investigators. I hired an attorney in Phoenix, Joe Romney. He got investigators involved and because she was living with her parents and she, was, uh, she didn't have any utilities in her name. Nobody could track her down. Mm-hmm. She had nobody knew who the hell she was and couldn't find her. And what few leads that those private investigators then discovered that gave me in the form of a report, and I took it upon myself to leave Denver, go down to Phoenix, and follow up on those leads. And sure enough, I drive up in front of an address that was given to me. Turned out it was her parents. And I see my two kids playing in the street. Is that Brandon? And- Brandon and I. Mm-hmm. Imagine the surprise when, I, when a friend of mine that I was staying at who worked for a credit card company, did a skip trace on her ass. She just applied for a Macy's credit card. Bam, all of her current information, addresses, phone numbers, the whole nine yards. I called the phone number on there to find out it's in her sister's name. Do you think she wasn't surprised when I'm the one on the other end? Now, you know, obviously I don't know that. The marshal's office, well to me, that's a fundamental fucking problem in our community. There's no reason for me to assume that when I'm communicating to the marshal's office that these things weren't being immediately con- distributed to sheriff's department, Durango Police Department, and all entities within the county of La Plata. I had no idea of any of this shit. How in the hell am I supposed to understand this? All I can tell you is that I was in Bayfield, the most logical and easiest place for me to 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 initiate my concern for Dylan and not being heard from at this point all day was to go to the uh, Bayfield Marshal's office. The question now becomes, how did Dylan get up here? I think that's a question we all want to know the answers to. Being a logical thinker and understanding my environment as best as I can and I will tell you that both Corey and Dylan know this environment probably much more than I do but I will tell you that it's not out of the realm of possibility for Dylan to have traveled up here would he do that? I don't know why would he do that? again, I don't know but you can't exclude that off the list so the way I look at it is there's a list of probability You know, the probability that Dylan could have walked up here and migrated himself up here is probably lower on the list than somehow somebody bringing him up here and dumping him off. But by the same token, you know, the question comes to me is, you know, is Dylan alive or is Dylan dead? And I think that's the importance of understanding that 98 of percent of his remains is still at large and obviously I can't help but think that the more of him that we can gather and the more that we can be evaluated we can you know we can rule in or out things like knife wounds or gunshot wounds or for blunt force trauma or any of those kinds of things to understand that 
you know, Dylan could have been alive or Dylan could have been dead at the time that he, he was up here. I don't know the answers to these questions, but these are certainly questions that I have, and I don't think it's unreasonable for me to sit down with law enforcement and have this conversation with them. You know, I appreciate that they're treating this as a homicide or a criminal investigation or however it is they want to treat that. He doesn't want to admit his shortcomings, and he'll tell you that he has made bad choices, but he does not like to talk about them. When he's called on it, he becomes very angry. So you, you don't know him personally, correct? I do not. Have you had an incident where you met him before, however? Yes. Sort of, I guess. Is this okay. the incident that I need to do the limiting instruction? Yes, Your Honor, and this would be a good time. Thank you. Ow. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence you're about to uh, hear about is admitted for a limited purpose. The evidence is not being admitted to prove the defendant had a bad moral character, and the jury cannot use this evidence for that purpose. This evidence is being admitted in an attempt for the prosecution to prove that the defendant became violently enraged when confronted by others concerning his sexual preferences. They can be used by the jury for these purposes and no other. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> and as, as we approach that incident, uh, Ms. Berry, so how long were you involved in the search for Dylan uh, while he was still a missing child? Well, I came for the search. Um, I came for the gathering in February of 2013. At this point, we didn't really know for sure what had happened. Um, and then up, up until they found his remains, I guess, he was a missing person. Okay. So from February to roughly late June? Correct. And were you interacting with Denise Hassel and Hall and, and that group of uh, people who were interested in finding Dylan? Mostly Denise Hess. Okay. And then what happened? Was there a, an instance when Dylan's remains were found and a lot of people were very upset? Yes. Can you just explain um, how you became aware that Dylan's remains were found? Um, I was here in Durango, or I was in Vicedo at the time, and I remember, I remember somebody saying that they had found a shoe or something. I mean, we knew at that point that they had. I, I'm trying to think if this is. It's hard to remember the exact date, but they had confirmed that Dylan's remains were found that day. That was the day, and that was the day that Elaine received a text message from Mark that said that he he hoped her and her colon cancel riddled BFF died, and that she died too. That's what he said. Dr. Bowser, sir, you need to object just a little sooner before it gets out. Um, do you have a response to the hearsay objection? I mean, I th so you, the answer is, Judge, that it informed what they did next. And that's I, the reason that's relevant. The objection is I, I didn't want to give you a reason. That's your job, so overruled. So that, that text message you referenced, did that upset people? That's why we went there, yes. Were people also upset generally? Like, was this yeah. a difficult time? It was a, probably one of the worst days, I think, ever. So how close in time was this to finding the remains that this whole interaction we're talking about? I think it was the same. I, I mean, I know they announced the remains that day that the, for sure they were Dylan, but that was not the day they, they found them. I believe it was earlier than that. <clears throat> so everyone was upset about the remains as well, both, both topics, I yes, guess. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So then did Denise Hess uh, and you, did you decide to go somewhere? Denise wanted to confront Mark about the text message. She wanted to go over there. She had been talking about it for a, few, a couple of hours. She was enraged and wanted to go confront Mark okay. about the text. Okay. And so everybody pretty much calmed her down. She wasn't going to go, but then she was going. Okay. Um, was there also, um, and we'll get to this so when, you, when you got there, but was there also discussions leading up just about the idea of confronting the defendant about Dylan as well?
I don't recall that. No. I mean, it was more just, I want to talk. I want to, she was really angry about the, I mean, she knew Mark and she was upset about the text. Understood. So what did you do at that point? I told her that I would drive her over there okay. if she wouldn't go alone because she was going to go alone. Did you in fact drive over there? I did. And where was over there? Around from where I was, I was pretty close to the lake over on Mushroom Lane. And so we just basically drove down the road and took a right and drove down the road and we passed and then a dead end. So we slipped back and came back. And that's when he was standing there. Is this the Mark Redwine's home in Biocito at 2343? Uh, County Road 500 up north of the lake? Yes. When you drove over there uh, and you flipped around, then where did you go? We were driving back and Mark was standing at the door. I think he was standing there in his underwear. And he asked, he, he or Kat said, stop, stop. So I stopped. Kat. Oh, I'm sorry, Denise. Hef. I call her Kat. Um, so we stopped. And do you want me to continue about? So where did you stop? We stopped right in front of his house on the road. Did you ever go on his property? No. Did you ever get out of the vehicle? No. And when you stopped out front, he was already kind of at the doorway? Yeah. Uh, what did you do then? Um, I was pretty freaked out. Um, I was just kind of sitting there. Kat was doing most of the talking. Denise was doing most of the talking to Mark. They were yelling um, back and forth. She, um, what was she yelling at him about? It started it started out, she, she said, hey, Mark, you know, why don't you come outside? And he said, fuck you, why don't you come over here? And she said, I'm not coming on your property. And he laughed at her and said, come on. And so it more, I mean, he called her the C word. I think she called him a few names. It, it, I mean, they, they interacted for a couple minutes. Did it remain verbal? Yes. At some point, did she say something about not letting him forget uh, what he'd done to Dylan? She did. And then, oh, go ahead. She did. Um, she said, because he had said something to her about dying of cancer, something about the last breath, and he was laughing. And she said, yeah, well, yeah, you know, I will, it will be my last breath, and I will, I will make you pay for what you did to Dylan, or I will, I can't remember, but it was in reference to that. So, in and even saying what he did to Dylan did, did stay verbal all that time. At some point, did you did you speak up and yell something at him too? I did. Um, so I was pretty quiet. Then actually, through the whole thing, I said nothing, and I I kept I was tapping her like let's go, let's go. I was kind of I mean I was kind of afraid of him anyway. But um, she um, they kept talking, and when he said when he said something about that he would dance or something when she was dead or, and he was laughing. I remember him laughing. What did you say to him? Um, I, I'm telling you, I literally lost my mind. I reached, I flew over the, the seat. I was almost on top of me. I took my seat belt off first. I flew over the seat. I had my head out the window and I, I called him a shit eating, motherfucking, piece of shit, eating, asshole. I, I, I really it went on and on. I think I might probably said it 10 times. Let me stop you. Did you specifically, you just said shit eating? Yes. Were you specifically referring to photographs yelling at him, calling him a shit eater? Yes. Did his response change from a verbal argument where he was laughing and, and cursing yes. to something different at that point in time? Yes. Please explain that to the jury. Um... So he had come out the door at one point. Kat was telling him to come out. He was telling her to come on his property. And he was standing kind of by the driveway. And that's when, you know, he was kind of coming towards my car. And I was, I was screaming. And then all of a sudden, he, he picked up this log off this, it was like a stove or something in the yard. I can't, I can't remember what it was, like an oven or something. And he, and he picked up that, that log and he 
freaking like, ah, like this. And all I remember was, I don't know if you've ever seen the cartoon where the eyes bulge out and all you can see is the whites of the eyes, but that's all I saw. And it scared the shit out of me. And I just said, let's go. And Kat was, she was still, she was saying something else. And then I, I said, eat more shit. And I hit the gas when I went. Did he come towards the vehicle? He stopped at one point, but he was pretty damn close. So he had been, you described, at a location at the doorway. Yes. And then a location at the, at the he was, cl- he was closer up by the driveway as, and From yeah, the- he was at the edge of that driveway. Came all out the door. Yes, but he didn't leave his property. And then why did you speed off? Well, I didn't want him to hit my car with the log or cat. Um, Were you scared that might happen? I was absolutely convinced it was going to happen if I didn't go. Yeah. That he was either going to hit the car or hit cat because she was closer. She was on that passenger side. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Berry. You're welcome.